What's poppin' Monster Hunters? It's me, MT, and welcome back to the Heavy Spoilers Show. And spoilers for Monarch Legacy of Monsters Episode 9 coming to your faces because we've got to talk about that crazy ending that causes the dual narrative of Monarch Legacy of Monsters to merge in the most surprising way. So let's just jump into this new world of possibility together, my nerd babies. And hey, if you like what we're doing here on Heavy Spoilers, maybe consider dropping a like harder than the US military dropped Lee Shaw into that hole of hell. Really helps with the channel, man. But anyways, let's start off by talking about the most wild stuff first. And I don't know about you, but I definitely consider Kate Randa's meeting with the young version of her supposedly dead grandmother, Keiko Randa, to be pretty damn wild. Like, how the hell did that happen anyway? Well, let's first talk about those portals themselves. We got our first look at the weird space, timey-wimey effects of these hollow earth portals during the episode when our protagonists are left wandering the frozen wastelands of Alaska, causing Shaw, May and Kate to appear to walk around in a giant circle to nowhere as they froze their emotionally traumatized butt cheeks off. Lee Shaw then hints to the girls that his own trip to the Hollow Earth first exposed him to these strange effects that both of these portals as well as the kaiju that emerge from those portals have on the surrounding areas. And during this episode, we definitely see some of the more drastic sides of those effects when we see a young Lee Shaw's brave journey to the Hollow Earth along with a team of fellow researchers. Researchers by the name of Hest, Burke, and Brant, as indicated by their helmets. As soon as those explorers are sent through the portal, their journey causes this massive electromagnetic gravity storm that causes nearby metal and whatnot to bend and random shit to start flying into nearby military personnel who were attempting to watch history as America entered under space with the same patriotic pride that America would have a few years later in 1969 when they beat the Soviets to the moon. Like, I really enjoyed how they recreated the astro not walk with these four hollow earth explorers. And we actually do see a picture of these four explorers on May's computer earlier in the series as May is looking through Bill Randa's old files. But anyways, I believe these two events of this episode happen because of two things. With the first of them being the electrostatic membrane of the portal that Shaw's team went through and the second one being the sheer force of gravity that the hollow earth emits on its own just by existing. By the time of the events of Godzilla vs. Kong in 2024, Apex Cybernetics and Monarch have recorded high levels of gravitational distortions that happen when people travel through these hollow earth portals. Also referred to by Dr. Houston Brooks and the scientists at Monarch as gravitational inversion boundaries, or JIBS. But unfortunately, in order to get this data, the life of one of Monarch's explorers, David Lind, was lost due to not having the right equipment to withstand the immense gravitational shift that traveling through these gravitational inversion boundaries create. This all being said, while the electrostatic storm that Bill Randa, General Puckett, and the rest of the observing audience in 1962 endured following Shaw's disappearance into the jib was likely due to the electrostatic nature of these portals. While the time-distorting effects of the portals themselves are likely due to the Hollow Earth's immensely strong presence of gravity. Like, if you've watched any of my previous MCU videos on my Infinity Stone radiation theory called the Marvel Trigger Theory, Theory, then you'll already know that I've talked at length about gravity's scientific relationship with the concept of time, and how the green time stone, as well as Loki's green magic powers, are tied to gravity itself. Like, if you haven't watched that follow-up video on the Loki finale that I made, I highly recommend that you give it a watch sometime, by the way, because it's some really great stuff, and I dive into this concept of gravity a little bit. But anyways, Marvel shit aside, because this is not a Marvel video, in science, the passage of time is extremely dependent on how strong the gravity for the people in the area is. So because of this, time flows differently on different planets and celestial bodies, due to those planets and celestial bodies having differing mass. So while the people who live on the surface of Monarch Earth are used to the normal passage of Earth time due to living on Earth their entire lives, as soon as those Earthlings are brought to a different environment with a stronger type of gravity, the passage of time flows differently for them in that new hollow Earth environment than it does for anyone else back on Earth. Like, y'all ever watch the movie Interstellar? Remember when Matthew McConaughey and his team went through that crazy time dilation during their quick but harrowing trip to that water planet? It was due to that planet's close proximity to a massive gravity manipulating black hole that caused those protagonists to be able to witness their loved ones grow older through a series of video diaries while they themselves barely aged at all. 
And again, not to spend too much time on the MCU in a non-MCU specific video, but another great example of gravity's effect on space-time in science fiction comes in the form of Sakaar from Thor Ragnarok. Because much like the Hollow Earth, Sakaar is home to a crazy amount of wormholes that dump random people that travel through them onto the surface of the planet. And that is very likely due to the immense gravity that Sakaar's mass manipulates just by existing. Because wormholes don't manifest out of nowhere, of course. Gravity always plays a massive role. But anyways, the point of this is, I believe that it is because of Sakaar's gravitational difference to that of Earth's that Hulk was able to meet a grown-up version of his son, Scar. A son who did not exist a few short years ago from Hulk's perspective. Due to gravity's time-dilating effect on the planet, the people living on Sakaar had time passed drastically quicker than people like Hulk who lived on Earth. Like, it's weird as hell to think that time isn't the same everywhere in the universe, but that's the power of gravity, man. But speaking of black holes, during a previous episode of Monarch, Monarch Agent Barnes actually compares the radiation readings coming from these hollow Earth sites to be comparable to the readings found from black holes in outer space. So given all of these factors, I think it's pretty safe to say that gravity is going to be playing a big role in Monarch, just like it did in Godzilla vs. Kong. But anyways, this episode also taught us exactly how humanity first discovered how to access the hollow Earth reality itself, with General Puckett revealing that humans cannot cross these gravitational inversion boundaries without a Titan actively traveling through that wormhole bridge between realities as well. So in order to get one of these Titans from the Hollow Earth to stabilize these wormhole tunnels, Dr. Suzuki's gamma radiation simulator was being used to bait Titans to travel through these wormholes before disabling the simulator halfway through their journey so that these traveling Titans get discouraged from actually reaching Earth. Because if those Titans no longer smell a tasty gamma radiation food source, then they have no reason to visit the human reality at all. However, now that we know this, we might now have a better understanding of what exactly Hiroshi Randa could have been doing in the Algerian desert. Since a Titan being inside of one of these wormhole tunnels is necessary for human travel through these tunnels, it seems to me that Hiroshi Randa was probably baiting a kaiju in order to use the tunnel himself. But that's just a guess, of course. But when Hiroshi finally reunites with his son Kentaro in his office at the end of the episode, he reveals that something went dangerously wrong with his gamma radiation simulator test in the desert, definitely implying that Godzilla himself showing up was not part of Hiroshi's expectations for his experiment at all. However, since we the audience know that Monarch has been noticing a strange spike in radiation ever since Shaw and the Outlaws started blowing up hollow earth tunnel entrances, it would appear that Godzilla's surprise appearance in the desert might just be an unintended consequence of Shaw's drastic actions, because whatever he's doing is messing up the portal structure of the hollow earth. But anyways, we of course got to talk about the hollow earth itself, because this place is such an interesting realm, mostly because it seems like the very ground itself is a conduit for massive amounts of energy. When Shaw and Mei first wake up in the Hollow Earth, they're nearly killed by a field of charged lightning strikes that Shaw states happens every time one of those rifts close, which is something he of course saw firsthand as Monarch Explorer Burke had one of those blasts of lightning cut straight through her body. But even outside these random bursts of lightning that shoot upwards towards the rocky Hollow Earth sky, the background of Shaw and Mei's surroundings in this episode glow with blue and orangish yellow energy, the same two colors that have historically been associated with Godzilla and Kong, respectively. The logo and promo materials for Godzilla vs. Kong very strongly associate these two titans with those two colors. And the battle axe that Kong uses in Godzilla vs. Kong appears to be a symbolic unification of these two energy sources, as it appears to be a weapon empowered by both these blue and orange hollow earth energies, with the sharp part of the axe of course being made of one of Godzilla's species' blue radioactive scales, and the very handle of the axe being the energized bone of an unnamed species. But seeing as Godzilla vs. Kong was a story about the unification of both Godzilla and Kong after a legendary rivalry between their ancestors, it would not surprise me at all if this orange energy was tied to the Kong species. The Scar King from the Godzilla x Kong trailer seems to be affiliated with this orange theme as well. 
But anyways, the point is, much like how the Godzilla vs. Kong movie first showed us that the terrain of the Hollow Earth was permeated by this mysterious blue glow of powerful radiation from the very core of the Hollow Earth, the Monarch show is also seeming to imply that this blue energy source is only one type of meaningful type of energy in this cinematic universe. There seems to be a balance between blue and orange here. But anyways, this episode of course has a new type of kaiju popping up onto the scene in the form of this giant warthog with tree bark like skin. Skin that it undoubtedly uses to camouflage into its forest environment to protect itself from other predatory kaiju. But we also get the return of some familiar mutos that we've seen before, like when we see Shaw watching TV footage of the Honolulu kaiju face-off between Godzilla and the main muto titan from the 2014 movie. A face-off that would kick Lee Shaw out of retirement. But another returning kaiju that might be a little tougher to see here comes in the form of the dragon kaiju that Lee, Keiko, and Bill ran into at the wreckage of the USS Lawton. That particular kaiju species seems to make their appearance as the very same kaiju that appears on the Hickok monitoring screen right before Lee and his soon-to-be slain team make their descent into one of the planet's many spicy gamma irradiated booty holes. And I honestly believe that we see the same a dragon appear again later on right before they're about to claim the life of monarch explorer Hest and once more as they fly through the very same portal that ends up sending Lee back to the future. 20 years into the future actually, which would make Lee closer to 70 than to 90, which is of course why everyone says he looks good for his age, because he's not actually 90. And when Lee arrives to the year 1982 from his original 1962, he runs into an adult Hiroshi Randa after holding Hiroshi's future wife Amiko hostage. Shaw instantly knows that he's looking at an older Hiroshi after Hiroshi presents the very same pocket knife that Lee gave to him when he was a child. These pocket knives are actually called Higonokami knives, and they became super popular around 1896 after metalsmiths were forced to become creative with their livelihood after the era of katana-wielding samurai came to a close. Every Higonokami knife has the name of the maker of the knife, as well as the type of metal the knife is made out of carved on the side. These knives were super popular to have back in the day, and many people used them to sharpen their pencils, which is something that Hiroshi Randa undoubtedly did with his knife across the world as he left pencil shavings at all of his work sites, very much implying that Lee Shaw is someone that Hiroshi thought of often as he lived his mysterious exploring life, a life that he immediately starts to regret after Kentaro tells him the news of what happened to Kate. But anyways, that is it for this breakdown of this super exciting episode 9 of Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Good God, do I love the cinematic universe so much. It is so cool to be able to see the scientific side of all of this cool MonsterVerse stuff. And watching this show has literally made me super excited for the new Godzilla X Kong movie coming out because I have got to know the secrets of the hollow earth now, man. Like all of this science stuff is like crack to my science loving brain. But anyways, you can follow me at Master on Twitter, Instagram, or wherever I am on the internet, but most importantly, you can follow Heavy Spoilers here on YouTube, and make sure you hit that notification bell so that you always get notifications every time we upload a video, because that's how we do things in 2024. Do not forget to be kind to one another before I see you guys again, because the world sucks, and everyone needs a little kindness. All right, guys, love you guys so much, and I'll see you guys later. Goodbye.